Guitar Villains is brought to you by American Musical Supply. Just visit AmericanMusical.com for your unique coupon code. This is just for listeners of Guitar Villains. Anything you need, whether it's picks, guitar strings, cables, a capo, all those small little accessories, all the way up to the big stuff like a new guitar, an amp, all the gear you could ever want is at American Musical Supply. They also have no interest financing, so you can play now, pay later. Use the link in the description for your coupon code to use on your next gear purchase. Thanks to American Musical Supply for sponsoring Guitar Villains. Now let's get to the show. Oh, do I have a guitar villain for you today? Zach Wild. Welcome to episode five of season two of Guitar Villains. This is a long time in the making in the ether of the universe in my life. I've been listening to Zach since I was 15 and I first heard the No More Tears guitar solo, which I talked to him about because I had kind of a unique first listening experience for that particular tune. And I don't know how else to sum up this conversation other than warning explicit language and warning tons of fun. Zach is an extremely nice guy and I felt like I knew him for years just chatting with him for the first time. Without further ado, guitar villains, Zach Wild. Welcome to Guitar Villains, the show where we deconstruct and decode the guitar. And Zach, you're one of the more poetic and unique guests that we've had on the show. I just want to read you a quote. I was doing some homework for our chat today, and I came across you articulating what got you started playing guitar. Somebody asked you, how did you discover music was your passion? You said something along the lines of, why do you love Black Sabbath? Why do you love Led Zeppelin? Why do you love the Allman Brothers, Elton John, Al Miola, Robin Trower, whatever? It's because you enjoy it. It's like, you know, when the immortal beloved, I think you're referring to your wife there, and you use some very choice words. I'll let you I'll let you, <laughs> I'll let you recall what those were, but something along the lines of smashing you into realms of pleasuredom. You said, I don't dissect it. I just go, I enjoy this. And as as hilarious as that is, man, it's poetry. It's so true. And I just want to applaud your ability to convey the feeling of loving yeah, let music. Me, let me hit you. Let me hit with with another one. This is from Father Vi, from Father Steve. Yep. This is this is a great quote as well. There, you know, like when we say, "Who's the best guitar player? Or who's the best drummer? Or who's the best singer? Or who's the best whatever?" Right. Like, you know, when that debate always comes up, which is which is kind of a weird thing, because even, even, you know, King Edward always said, he goes, but there is no, he goes, like, music, he goes, it's not sports. You know, it's not like, bench, you know, a, a powerlifting meet where you know who the strongest guy is because obviously his numbers are, the, you know, are the highest. Whoever benched the most, whoever squatted, whoever deadlifted the most, whoever had the highest numbers wins the meet. So, you know what I mean? Or, or sports, you know, a baseball game or a football game, there's a winner at the end of the game. But like music, like Steve said it, he goes, it's it's not who's the best, it's who's your favorite. It's like pizza. Which what's your favorite pizza? They're all good, they're all slamming. You know what I mean? It's just like, or do you like it just plain? Or do you like it with garlic and mushroom? Do you like it with pepperoni? Do you like it with sausage? You, you know what I'm saying? Which is the saying. truth. I mean, well, it's just like saying, What's your favorite Zeppelin record? There is no favorite, they're all good. They're, I mean, they're all amazing, actually. I mean, but the whole thing is, it's like, well, I've been wearing out Led Zeppelin 2 for a while, so I'm I'm listening to Presence now because I haven't listened to that for a while. So, yeah, I mean, it, it really is the truth. There is no, it's what's your favorite, yep. you know what I mean? Or, or, or whatever mood you're in for that day, you know what I mean? You really think about it. So it's the truth. Yeah, and I think it's hard for a lot of people to get to that state of mind, you know, like, some people like to be controversial and argumentative and it's hard, you know, to, to just accept actually everything's good. I don't know if there's a key to reaching that. Well, there is a favorite, like, you know, just to give advice to the younger players, uh -huh. you know, 
when your girlfriend or your wife says, who's your favorite girl? You say, <laughs> you, definitely you. You don't say, well, you know, there's, there's lots of great women out there. You know, you don't say that. You know, you don't, you don't go there. You just say, you, there's only one. <laughs> Maybe the wisest words we'll hear today. Yeah, because otherwise, if you don't, you'll never be able to continue playing guitar and, <laughs> and enjoying all these pedals and amps and everything like that. So, yeah, just, just go with, just take my advice on that one. Good advice. So the show's Guitar, guitar Villains, uh, I think villains are just as cool, if not cooler, than heroes. I've always found that characters are deeper and more memorable. That's why I call this show Guitar Villains. And I want to ask you, out of all the comic book or movie supervillains out there, who would you say you might identify with the most? And this doesn't have to be evil ways. Sometimes villains have some good elements about them. Is there anybody that pops to mind? Um, I don't know. Uh, let me see. I guess maybe yeah, I'll go with Wonder Woman, you know? <laughs> She's not a villain, though. Well, I guess if you get on her bad side. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you are Wonder Woman's bad I guess side. She could be a villain if you say, you're not my favorite. <laughs> That's great. Oh, man. No, yeah, um, no I like uh, I like that. I'll, you I'll embody that would, have, that would have to be up to debate for everybody else. But, uh, you know, yeah, I guess, I guess you'd have to go with, uh, I don't know. I guess, I guess since I have a beard now, I guess we'd have to go with or some Viking thing, you know, Odin, maybe Odin, but, uh, Odin yeah, is just, who I had. Just yeah. in, because somebody, I remember when I had a beard, they go, Oh, what, what are you, you know, they, so I forget, you know, that's why we said, you know, even with the guitars with Wild Audio, like, why why do you go with all the Viking mythology, you know, with the guitars, the Nomad, mm-hmm. the, uh, the Barbarian, the Odin, you know, everything like that. So, you know, but we were going to go with tap dances, but, you know, <laughs> we didn't want any lawsuits or anything like that, you know. Because in Black Label, we do enjoy a lot of soft shoe and some tap dancery, <laughs> but, you know. So we just went with the Viking thing just because I got a beard. Yeah. Yeah, it suits you. So uh first things first, man, I have a couple softball lobs for you. I call this segment burning questions. I, I'm not gonna get burned, am I? Just gonna say, you know. <laughs> no, I think you'll be good. I'm not man. burn my footsies because you know it might hurt my you know, might put a damper on my tap dancery and my soft shoe. Yeah, but you'll go ahead. Tap Let's dance across some embers here. Uh, so these questions don't totally matter, but for some reason, as guitar players, we'd like to know the answers. So first thing, what gauge pick do you use? Um, so I'm, I'm not sure the, the gauge of it, but it's definitely, it's stiff. It, you know, it's definitely hard. It doesn't, you know, there's no, it doesn't, it's not flip floppy. You know what I mean? Yeah. So makes sense. It, yeah. It's hard. And then, uh, like I use a, I use like, uh, the, the Dunlop, the Tortex, I definitely like the Tortex one just in regard because the tip is, it comes to a point. It's not rounded. Mm. So, uh, well, let's see if I can grab some of them around here, but, uh, but the whole thing is, yeah, those are, they're great. But I like Dario, father Dario ends up using, he likes those jazz picks, yeah. the little guys to, to me, they're too, they're too small, you know what I mean? But, uh, but I got a couple of my friends actually love the the really small jazz picks, but uh, and they, you know with the and same thing with the the point at the end, you know what I mean. So and like you said, not grounded, but it is. But the pick, the pick thing is definitely uh, it's definitely interesting. You, you know what I mean? Because you could have twenty guys in a room and they all use different different picks. You know what I mean? So it's it's definitely a preference thing, man, for sure. What about string gauge? What string gauge do you prefer? Um, probably maybe, uh, the 10 to 46. And then obviously when we're doing the heavier things, I think we use, uh, either a 60 gauge, you know, but a 60 or a 56 mm-hmm. or 52 anywhere in between there. But, uh, but definitely the heavier bottoms, you know, so this way the guitar is not because we, we tune down a whole step, you know, and some of them are like in Sabbath tunings, you know, the, the grimace hits, it's just, it's almost like a C sharp. Mm. It's either it's like a whole step and a, and a smidgen more. So it's just, you know, just to get the chunky, you know, just everything's fatter. So, uh, but, 
for those tunings, definitely the lower gauge string. So it's not so flip floppy, you know, but I mean, obviously if you're going to be 440, you know, playing with a piano or anything, always like the, the uh, 10 to 46, you know what I mean? So gotcha. yeah, you try tuning up, try tuning up a 60 gauge up to a piano. You're, the neck of the guitar just pretty much snaps right off, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. What is your uh, what's your number one guitar currently? Um, all of them. You know, I, I, like every morning I'll wake up and uh, I'll play it. You know, I'll just either pick up one of the you know because right now we have like the Heathen, and then uh, I'll just go get that in a second. I got the Heathen, uh, the Nomad, the Barbarian. Uh, coming out with another one called the Thorax. We're we're designing that one right now. It's being made. But uh, no, I'll pick up I'll pick up all my fiddles every morning when I'm running scales, while I'm just having you know some bar hour job over here. Just while I'm just noodling, I'll just pick up a different one every day, you know. Nice. So I mean, it's so funny because with Father Steve, you know Steve Vive, uh, when we do the Generation X thing, I bust his chops all the time because he has that Ebo guitar. He's got we got fifteen guitars out on the road. He plays that one guitar, and then I just bust his chops all the time because, like, at the time, I guess they were promoting a new, you know, his new models. They had, like, these kick-ass-looking finishes on the guitars. And Steve would never play them live. I go, look at you. Look at you. You know, we're trying to sell some guitars here. (laughs) You know, we're trying to sell some guitars. I go, and I go, he's just staring at you going, hey, coach, can you put me in? Coach, can you put me in? You know, I go, what's the matter with you? And he just goes, nah, there's just some magic on this one, you know, the, the wood or whatever. I go, Steve, that's the magic's in your head, bro. I go, but the magic's in your hands and your heart, bro. You know, I I, I go, which is the truth, I mean, because it's 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 funny. Because when we do the, you know, whether it's Zach Sabbath, Black Label, or, or with the boss, with Oz, we'll do, you know, the VIP guitars. Yeah. And some nights I'm playing five different guitars that I've never touched before in my life, you mm. know, just brand new guitars. So, I mean, I'm just saying, you know, so there's stage play guitars and you, you know, I hand you that guitar, you're off and running. I mean, I'm just saying, I, it's not like I've ever been, if I don't have that one guitar, I can't, you know what I mean? I don't want to play any of the other guitars, you know, when you're out on the road, but you break a string or something like that. It's like, Oh, what am I going to do? You know, I don't have my number one. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, totally. I mean, Ozzy, you know, it was the grail and everything like that, but it's just like, you know, if there was different tunings, you're going to use a different guitar. You know what I mean? It's just like certain guys are are definitely, Steve definitely is like that, though. He's like, hey, if I don't have this guitar, I'm like, Steve, it's, they're all made amazing. All your guitars are, you know, every every wild audio guitar I've ever picked up are slamming. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm just saying there's not one where I, I just go, well, do me a favor. If there's 10 of them down at shop, pick me out like two good ones. I, there's never, I just, I could blindfold you and pick them up. You know, and like even the same thing when I was with, with Gibson and Epiphone, I've never picked up one of my Gibsons or one of my Epis that were not slamming. You know, I've, I've never had to go home, grab me two of them that are good out of the 10. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, like there's, Two good donuts and there's eight stale ones. I, you know, I mean, it's just not. They're all slamming, bro. Just, just pick one up. I can blindfold you and you'll play it. And then I'll hand you another one and you play it. Then I'll hand you another one. You go, are you goofing on me? Is that the one I just played a second ago? I go, no. It's another. It's a whole different guitar, man. So, uh, yeah. No, it's just I, I've never been like that. I mean, you know. So as far as favorites go, like I said, I love I love all the fiddles. I got you. Well, I'll package this last question together then. What is your, we'll just, we'll just say, what's one you're thinking about right now when it comes to amp and guitar pedal? Either uh, one. Well, obviously I've been using my wild audio, you know, the master 100s. I've been using that for a couple records now and when we bring it out on the road. So that, and then obviously all my pedals are just, you know, my, my, all my, my Dunlop pedals that I've used, you know? So, I mean, it's just, they're 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 perfect they're slamming and they work yeah i've I've never i've never been uh you know like a tone chaser in regards of constantly trying to improve a pot like what once i mean i'm basically using the same thing i've used when i recorded miracle man 
And right. that's it's the same rig. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? From Miracle Man to No More Tears to Perry Mason to uh, Pride and Glory to every black label album. I mean, everything I've, you know, the rig, it's just a, when I first started, it was just, it was my JCM 800, a 2203. And then uh, I remember that as far as tubes go, I remember uh, the amp had to get retubed. And I remember somebody stuck 6550 groove tubes in there, as opposed, you know, because your classic tube is the EL34. And uh, when they, they, that's all they had. So they put it because we were over in Europe somewhere. And so they put them in. They said, yeah, they didn't have the EL30. So they put the 65. And I'm, all I remember is playing. go, wow, it's, it's fatter and tighter. You know, I mean, it was just just thicker altogether. So, I mean, uh, I was just, that definitely made a difference. And, you know, and definitely with the EMG, with my pickups, obviously the EMG pickups. So like, there's certain things that go into every guitar player sound where it's just where you go, it, it's certain ingredients in the soup where you just go, they need to be in there. I remember, you know, with, like with EMGs, uh, like in regards, I'm just saying where any guitar player, you take it, anybody that can play, any any of the players we love, but you put Robin Trower on a Telecaster through a crate, uh, you know, through a Gorilla amp, he's still going to sound amazing. It's it's Robin Trower, so it doesn't, and, and no pedals, just him playing. Mm-hmm. So, but, you know, you put that strat in his hand and an old, Plexi or whatever, you know, whatever he used on Bridge of Size and like that's all, and you know, then all the magic starts coming alive. And the same thing with King Edward, you know, you could put him through any amp, any guitar, because any, you know, that's what all guitar players will tell you. It's in your hands, you know, and the play. But, uh, but there is definitely certain things that, that sound great. And I mean, I remember with the EMG pickups, I remember I had, uh, this is long before I started playing with Oz. I was giving guitar lessons, and I remember one of my students <clears throat> had like a. I had my uh, Gibson Les Paul with the PAFs in it, and I had a my Marshall uh, combo, a '79 combo, and uh, with a master volume and everything like that. So I remember we was playing. He, he I plugged him into it, and he had like a little Fender uh, Mustang with, and he had EMG pickups in it. And he just like whacked the G chord on this thing. And I was like, wow, that's what that amp is supposed to sound like. I, I mean, I could hear all the shimmer and highs, the mids and the lows. I, I mean, it was, it was as if I took a moving blanket and took it off the amp. Uh, and like, you could hear the clarity now. And I was just like, wow, this is amazing. And, and, and my, my Les Paul with the, with the PAFs, was all like muddy and just, you know, like if I played the low swings, you hear until I got up to the higher notes. Mm-hmm. On his guitar, you could crystal clear hear everything. And uh, so that's what sold me on EMG pickups. And that was long before the boss, you know, before I started playing with Oz. But just the clarity of everything, you know, because I mean, a pickup is like, it's, it's like a microphone, yeah. you know, and if you have a, you know, it depends. There's a reason why a telephone can mic cost $12,000. You know, there's a reason why. I mean, you know, that's why, I mean, you could be 50 feet away and I could still hear you walking through this microphone. It like, it's that crystal clear. You know what I mean? When you have like these insane microphones, but, uh, and that's what a pickup is in your guitar. It's a microphone. So, you know, the higher grade microphone, but you know, yeah, everybody has to try for themselves, you know? And I mean, I found out the difference too, when I was using tubes at, uh, Father Bob Dixon, Bob does all the work on my amps and stuff like that over here at the Amp Hall out in California. And we always bring them to Bob when they need some TLC before the tour, you know, just to make sure everything's working or if anything breaks or whatever. Right. Uh, we had Bob come up to the Vatican, you know, the, the studio. And right there, I had him putting different tubes into, into the same amp. We'd take it out, put different tubes, and we'd you know, record you playing a riff, a whole lot of love or whatever. Just play the riff over and over and over. And then and then we just a b listening to you playing a whole lot of love, just with the with EL34, 6550s, uh, Golden Lions, all, all the, you know, every different brand of tube. And it was amazing the difference 
in power tubes that I could hear that the difference that we could hear. You know, I mean, it was definitely noticeable. So that was a definitely an eye opener as well. That's because pretty- you, know, you figure I'll stick any old tubes in there. It's it really it really does make a difference in your you know just like you playing guitar and having different gauge strings. You can tell the difference. You know whether you have a super high you know, like a, a light gauge string or an extra heavy gauge string. You know, you, when you're playing, you can feel the difference. So it's, it's, it's one of the joys same. of playing guitar, man. Like once you once you hone your craft and you get to a point where you can really have your own voice on the instrument, that's when all these, uh, you know, tube adjustments and pedals and different amps and pickups and even string gauge like you're talking about, that's when it really starts to make a difference and just unlocks a whole new level of fun, honestly. Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, just with, uh, I, I think, you know, you, you try different things, just like food, you know, you try different things, you go, ah, I, I don't like that, or nah, I don't really like that, or man, this is amazing, you know, so it's just, uh, but yeah, I mean, as far as like guitar tones go, I mean, my whole thing is like when you get a, a slamming guitar tone and you're using certain gear, it's just like, why would you get rid of that? Yeah. You know, like, why are you going to change? You're like, we know that works. And we know that sounds amazing. Mm-hmm. Just use that, you know, as opposed to, you know, I mean, there's nothing wrong. You try different, different gear, try different amps, try different uh, speakers. And, and that's another thing too. I mean, like I use, I, I tried <clears throat> and the same thing. It was all accident too. You know, like I had lower gauge speakers. And I remember uh, we tried a cabinet one day. I tried like really high wattage speakers. And I was like, wow, you know, as, as far as, the, the punchiness and the, the, the tightness, I was just like, then you, you hear the difference, you know, so you mm-hmm. really do. So I think with everybody, it's just a matter of trying different things. Well, speaking of your guitar tone, I want to move on to a segment I call Name Those Notes. I'm going to play you a quick sequence of guitar notes from songs that you have recorded over the years and you have to tell me what song the notes are from so we're going to see how well you know you're playing and it'll spur some conversation about the song sound good let me just get a cup of coffee it's just uh, hold on grab a cup of coffee we're going to be here a minute all right hold on i'm looking forward to this all right I right, let the comedy begin. Let's do this. Go All right. for it. Here's the first note. Oh, come on. <laughs> um, is that uh? That's yeah. gotta be uh. Is that Mary had a little lamb? Close. <laughs> it's about as actually. It's not as. It's not as difficult to play as Mary had a little lamb. Uh, it's no more tears. Okay, go ahead. So when I first heard this guitar solo, man, uh, I was 15 years old and it was actually you demonstrating the solo without any backing track or anything. I think it was like total guitar TV. It was called or something. And I actually heard the solo before I heard the song. And I don't know how many times that's happened. No more tears, right? cool way to experience it for the first time so when i went back and listened to the song thousands of times eventually um it was just a uh, it kind of hits different when i hear that solo because i'm like i know exactly what that sounds like without the music um do you remember do you remember the composition uh do you remember the composition process for no more tears usually i mean uh i mean you know you obviously you know you have the two schools of 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 soul. And I mean, you know, I could either just press play and just let you go for it, you know, mm-hmm. and then we can keep whatever, you know, take you got that cause it's fire and it's, you know, you play into the back and track or whatever, you know what I mean? Like, you know, you have X amount soul or we can comp a bunch of them together or, you know, you got the St. Rhodes school of writing where you just sit with it and compose a solo, you know, like stairway to heaven, hotel, California, and I mean the same thing with Randy solos. You, I could literally play you one of some of his solos, and like you would even you would know the song. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. That's crazy train. Uh, That's flying high again. That's revelation. That's over the mountain. That's it. I mean, like it's pretty crazy. I mean, that's how it, you know, that with Randy solos, it's, it's his writing. You know what I mean? What, you know, his legacy is, is his aside of, uh, you know, with everybody, it's, it's the writing. You know what I mean? When you talk about Bach, Mozart, Beethoven, it's, it's what they wrote. So, uh, but it's Randy's aside of his amazing chops and his tone and his feel and everything like that. It's his composition and his writing. So, you know, you sit down with it and I still do it to this day. You know, you sit, I'll have the back and track and I, and then you work on something, you know, so it has a beginning, a middle and an end, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? So, you know, you get something that you're happy with, you know? So that's so, how you attack no more tears. You kind of sat with it and. Yeah. And I think I, I, that was like, I, I, looking back on it, I can't remember like physically where, where I sat. I remember like when I, when I did, I don't want to change the world. I remember I was sitting upstairs in A&M working that out. But uh, I did remember like we did one pass on it and I was like, oh, let me double it or whatever. I said, you know, let me see if I can double it. And they go, no, nah, just like we double the bunch of the solos or whatever. And, and you know, the, and there's only one rhythm guitar in that as well. Mm. You know, so I, the whole rest of that record, you know, I'm doubling everything, you know, just so it, it has that tone and it gets wide and, and huge. But uh, I remember I was like, oh, let me double again. And Dwayne and John were like, nah, you, you doubled it. Just leave it. It sounds slamming the way it is. So, you know, because I was like, oh, man, I want to double it or whatever. But we just left it with the one guitar and uh, and one rhythm track. So, but, uh, yeah, I, I, there was just that was just a one take, I, you know. So I said, oh, let me, oh let me, let's go for it. Just press record, and I played it, and that was it. Well, it's a beautiful solo, man. I'm going to move on here. Here's the next gra- group of notes. <laughs> Oh, what is that? War Pigs? Yes, it is. Yes, what is that from Zach Sabbath or with that, Oz or that's something from, like that? That's from Zach Sabbath. And uh, you affectionately refer to as the stupor group. And uh, yeah. <laughs> Sabbath, <laughs> uh, Sa- I'm telling you, man, you're a poet. You got away with words. Um, that's why I tell the wife every day when we wake up and I look into her eyes. She looks into mine and I say, you're the lucky winner. <laughs> <laughs> Um, how do you, so that, that's obviously, um, you guys did Sabbath's first album or I'm saying Sabbath's first album, I should say was basically just live. Like they went in the studio, cut live their live set essentially. And of course, a lot of older records were cut that way. How do you approach the studio these days? Do you guys go at it live or was a lot of it, uh, individual tracking? Obviously yeah, things have been yeah, different. The way we do it, it's awesome. I, I just, uh, you know, like, like put it, put it this way. You, if you wrote, oh, let's say, let's say you wrote War Pigs this morning, right? And you're like, Zach, I got the song I wrote, this, you know, like, while you're having coffee or whatever, and you jam it on one of the guitars in the back there. So you just go, down it, and you get all, and then you had the melody. You're like, I don't have lyrics for it yet, but you're like, it's going to go, down, 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 down. Then you're going to go, down it, and then we, down it, right? Let's say, that's what, the way you have it. Yeah, and you have this thing all worked out. We'll just go in the Vatican and I'll have, I'll just press record and put you to a click track and you'll play the whole song the way you have it. You know what I mean? Let's just say if it's, if it's warping. So let's, we'll take something even simpler though. Let's say if it's uh, Tush by ZZ Top. Let's say you have that. We'll record that to a click. You double track your guitars. We get your slamming guitar tone. Double track the guitars. It's all done. The song is done. And then when Father Jeff get in and Father JD, like just have Jeff just listen to it a couple times, and he's like, "All right, cool. Let me get in there." And he goes in the he goes behind the drums. We put on the cans, and he's got down, da down, da down, and he's like, "All right, Zach, they just kick it right in." And I go, "Yeah, a band of gun, da gun, da gun," and then he's in. And then he plays throughout the whole thing and he, you know, he just listens to the part and I'll just go and then stop here and then come back in again or whatever. And he's like, all right, cool. And Jeff can knock out the drums and then JD will put bass to it. It's done. There is no, there is no rehearsing. There is no going into a rehearsal hall and going over these parts. That's for, that's for when you're going to tour, bro. I mean, that's the way we roll. Gotcha. Yeah, it's, what a, it's a waste of time, waste of money. You can either play or you can't play. 
Like, what are we, what are we, I, I don't get it. But you know the song, right? All right, let's record it. I, I, this is like ridiculous. We're going to go practice? <laughs> practice? Are you kidding? Hey, no, practice is for when we get ready for the tour, bro. You know, where the band all gets together and we get ready to tour. Now, we don't do that. I mean, the whole thing is, because what I'm saying is, what happens if you write a song right now and you're in the studio? Uh, you know what I mean? You could hear uh, Paranoid on the radio, me and you coming back after a coffee break, getting coffee for everybody. You hear something on the radio, you know, Heart of Gold or whatever by Neil Young. And you're just like, man, Zach, it'd be great if we had something like this. I go, yeah. And then when you get back to studio, you pick up your acoustic and you end up writing Free Fallen, would say. Yeah. I'm just saying, all right, let's record it. You're like, yeah, this will be great. You know, and you got a melody for it. And then you then you don't have lyrics, but you're like, this will be cool. And then you tell the guys where you want them to come in. Or where, I go, Let me, let's just record them. I'll set up a mic. You play acoustic, you know, play the song. <clears throat> put you to a click track off you go the studio is all about it the studio is all about performance and it sounds like you have a high <laughs> standard and that's the way you roll as you said i mean that's van, pretty van cool. Hale did it different you know like van hell back in the day you know with with eddie I, i'm sure throughout the whole thing even when with sammy and everything like they were doing the band played live mm -hmm. you know what i mean so but i mean for us it's just like I prefer the way we do it. I mean, it's just like I get it done. It's done. I mean, the guitar sounds slamming. I mean, everything's there. So then all Jeff has to do is go in and play. And if he messes up, we just go. He goes, when I get to this part, just punch me in. Yep. And I'll keep going. And, and it, you listen back to it, it sounds slamming. So, you know, I mean, for me, making the record is kind of like, is like making a house. You know, you get the foundation. Then we start putting up the you know, the rebar and you start putting up the walls and the, and the skeleton of the house. Then you start putting the, the sheathing on it and then we paint it and then, you know, and it's done. But, you know, as opposed to everybody trying to play together and it's just like the drummer keeps making mistakes. Or whatever. It's like, oh, well, well, we've got to this part and you messed up again or I messed up. Or what? You don't even know the song. You just wrote it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Totally. Like, you know, but so, yeah, I mean, I've always, we've always done it that way. So... Good insight there. Got another group of notes for you. We got two more, that, and we're getting a little bit more challenging, but I th I still think you're gonna get it. Here we go. Uh, suffering overdue. Indeed. Yes. There you go. This is my uh, this is my favorite Black Label Society solo. Uh, it really encapsulates, I think, everything I love about your playing. There's. The signature alternate picking licks, the, the harmonics from the vibrato that kind of blooms differently based on where you sweep the wah. Uh, the bends, which I believe are basically a guitar player's fingerprint. Um, I want to ask you about what you're thinking when you rip a solo like this as a, as a, you know, compared to No More Tears. Like there's some natural minor stuff, some pentatonic stuff. I think it's primarily rooted there. There's a little bit of chromaticism. So... My question is, how much music theory do you think about versus how much feel goes into stuff where you're just kind of, it sounds like off the cuff, you know, you have some lick ideas. Does it just come out that way? How much theory do you rely on versus your ear? No, I, I think, <clears throat> I think theories, you know, I mean, theory is awesome. I mean, I, and, and just understanding the fretboard and under, and having knowledge. I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, if, if, if me and you were, or were drawn comics like we were talking about before, super, you know, villains and superheroes, whatever. Mm -hmm. If we were to work for DC or Marvel, you know, one of our, our buddies is a great artist and he showed us how to shade. That's a, a great thing to know. <clears throat> so this way it makes our stuff look 3d and it, you know, it starts making everything come to life. But um, <clears throat> I think with music theory, it's awesome. You should know your scales and you should know, you know, it's a, it could never hurt. It can only help you knowledge, you know, just knowing more, having more crayons in your, in your, in your crayon box. Not that you're going to need them all. I mean, not that you're going to need to use harmonic minor or diminished or anything like, you know, like those scales, but you know, them just in case you want to use them. So, you know, uh, or arpeggios or whatever. I mean, if you want to use them, you have them, you know, so they're in your, it's like Batman. It's not like he has to use everything in his belt, but if, if, if he needs it, it's there. You know, so, but no, I mean, with that solo, I just, I worked that one out, 
sitting down once again. You know, I just sat, had the back and track done, 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 you know, and I worked out a solo where I want to start. And then all the scales that I had. And then when it went back into halftime where I wanted to go and then I, that's definitely, that, that solo there is, is completely worked out, you know, from the St. Rhodes School of Solo Writing. Once again, you have a beginning, a middle. I mean, I could play that thing back note for note, so, mm-hmm. which I do every night live whenever we've had it in the set. Awesome. So. Here's the last group of notes. Ready? Go ahead. Uh, Heart of Darkness. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is for I gotta know because that because we got the video out right now. Yeah, so, yeah. just just came out recently. <laughs> uh, this music video is intense, man. It's brutal shit. I I highly recommend people check it out. And um, this new release, you know, this part is you had the None More Black Box set, which has been released. Um, which I first heard of, by the way, from your amazing infomercial on your YouTube channel. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very yes, informative. Yeah. Yeah, so it's by the time you get done with it, you're like, I don't even know what they're trying to push or what they're selling. But I enjoy, I thoroughly enjoy the. That's the best marketing strategy. It's <laughs> memorable. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, yeah. So you guys like just tracked? I read like 30 songs. Is that true? Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, it's just you got to figure. I mean, the way the way I write as well. It's just it, like after after we get done writing. I mean, I look at it like this. Like let's say you're writing books and I'm your agent. Like you just got done writing Jaws that came out great. We're going to end up making a movie out of it, the whole nine yards. I'm like, you got anything else right now? You're like, no, I don't feel like looking at a book, reading a book. I'm booked out, man. You yeah. know what I mean? So, you know, you just almost kind of like, you know, at the end of a season, whether we won the World Series or we just had the worst season ever, but we, we got that close. We made the playoffs and we got beat. Like, I just don't, I don't even want to look at a baseball or a bat or the batting cages for at least for like a month. You know, I, I just got to get away for a little bit. So, but, uh, and just recharge the battery. So like after this implosion of writing, you know, you wrote Jaws and you came over, it's just like you step away. And then I'm like, you know, whatever, like a year later, I'm like, you thinking of anything? You're like, yeah, I got this idea. I read this thing about this kid getting possessed by by the devil, and then there was a you know bunch of Catholic priests, and they performed an exorcism. I think I'm going to call it the Exorcist, you know. And then you start writing this new book, you know what I mean? So, but you know, you just had just to get away and then just recharge and look forward to doing it. I mean, because I mean, every record I I look forward to doing it like. It's the beginning of a season, mm-hmm. you know. And like I said, whether whether we won the Super Bowl or we had the worst season or we got that close, I just look forward to it because it's a new beginning. And and you don't know what's gonna what you're gonna get. Yep. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know. Totally. So and so it, to me, it's always making the records is always magic. Well, sure. I know I notice in the latest music videos that you've been putting out, you got you guys are ripping some pretty awesome instruments. Uh, I want to use this as a little pivot to talk about Wild Audio. I just got this guitar. Check this thing out. Oh, the Barbarian! Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Psych, psychic bullseye. You get you get dizzy looking at that thing as well. It's got your yeah. uh, your. Oh, you tantalize somebody, shove it in their face a couple times. They they black out, and you you know there you go. <laughs> then you get, you're defeating crime once again. Indeed. It's got your uh, EMG 8185, the signature pickups, mahogany body, maple neck. It's a war machine. I, I've had it for a little while. Like I said, I love it so far. What goes through your mind when you are designing guitars like these? Um, well, I mean, obviously, that's a tweak on a classic SG and everything like that. So, I mean, yeah. you, you take me and you could have, you know, you look at, you know, your classic designs and then some of the newer designs and you go, man, it'd be great if we just blended the two of them together and then, you know, and see what comes out of that, whether it's the Nomad or, you know, some of the other thing now with just the thorax that's coming out. Let me just grab this other one. Hold on. So here's the heathen, right? Oh, that's cool. So you got, nice. so basically it's the Odin, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? So, but it's just, it's basically a double Odin. Yeah. So we just, you know, the bottom corner just made it a double cutaway. 
you know, your classic junior, you know. So, but that's what it is. So, but, uh, I mean, that's what this is, you know. So, obviously, you know, when it was obviously with the Les Paul thing, we just tweaked it so it looks like a Viking horn at the bottom. So, and it's just it's just me drawing on a piece of paper. And, I mean, you know, I'll just, like, if we blend a couple different guitars that we dig and it's just, like, tweak that and then move this and then just, and it's like, dude, boom, you hear it. There's a nomad. You got this. Now you got this body shape. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, no, it's fun, man. I love it. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change my situation for anything. I mean, I love being, I love all my Gibsons. I loved all my Eppies and I loved everybody I, that I rolled with over there. And I, I'm, I still have all those relationships. So I'm still friends with everybody, but, uh, because everybody always asks, they're just like, why'd you start your own guitar company? Or, you know, we're going to move into amps now and, and I want to do the pedals and we're doing the strings and stuff. But, uh, hmm. it's just for me, it was just like, you know, if Derek Jeter played for the Yankees. The only next step for Derek would be team owner. Well, now he, owns the, now he owns the Marlins. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So, <laughs> but where, whereas I'm saying it's not for everybody. I mean, you know, because a lot of, you know, whereas I'm just saying like with Oz, he, he doesn't want it like as far as production on the records, he's just like, just mix a thing. Let me hear it. And if I, you know, I'm not up there with the same thing, mixing the record, JD and Adam will be mixing it. And then they'll have me and you come up and go, guys, take a listen. Yeah. Tell me what you think. And then, you know, you're like, just like, you know, soup testing. And, you know, you're like, a little more Tabasco, and could you put a little more, uh, maybe a little more lime in there? And then, all, you know, we're just eating the soup, the tortilla soup or whatever it is, and we're like, perfect, that's great. You know, so like just a little more kick drum, maybe a little more, can you bring the solo up a little bit? Just a smidgen, not too much, you know what I mean? So everybody wants to be that involved. I'm just saying, yeah. whereas now, now that me and you were team owners, now we're involved with the trades, we're involved with me and you going to some high school to see some kid pitcher that's going to be the next Nolan Ryan. You know, so like me and you got to go, we're going to go check him out and then maybe do a contract with him and meet his parents or whatever. You know, so me and you were, we're all in every day. Now we have hotels set up in the stadium. You know, we have live. you know, it's a living, breathing thing. We have a mall in the stadium. We have restaurants in the stadium. We have—I mean, I'm just saying. Me and you were involved in everything now, not just not just the team and down to the way the grass is cut. I mean, everything, you know. So, to me, it's just you know, it's kind of like with Jimmy Page with Led Zeppelin. It's it's all you're all in. You know what I mean? I mean that is his life's work. It's his passion and it's and it's his obsession, and like he found what he loved and. And you do it. You know, that's what I always tell all younger players. I'm like, make the band your mom and pop shop. Make it your little coffee house. You know what I mean? You start small and then and then you you know you play in front of 10 people, then you play in front of 12 people, then we're playing in front of 18 people, and then you know what I mean? Definitely. And that's what you want to do with the rest of your life anyway. You wanna you wanna do the band. So make your band Led Zeppelin. You know, like Jimmy Page, that's, he oversees the whole thing. And he, I mean, here he is to this day. It's every day. It's, it's whether it's the, the books are coming out, remastering and reupholstering and recarpeting and remarrying and, you know, whatever, whatever <laughs> Led Zeppelin releases are coming out. But it's his passion and his obsession and, and make the band that, you know what I mean? Whether you're in a band with a U-Haul and you're building your empire, do it. Because you'll never, you'll always love it. Every day you'll look forward to it when you wake up. You're like, it's, what else can we do to build the build our empire? So, you know. Well, I mean, that's, that's definitely reflective of the, uh, you know, it, the wild audio definitely feels like a Zach Wild effort. So you're doing well on that front for sure, man. Yeah, the guitars, like I said, I mean, I, I mean, all the guitars are slamming. I mean, I, I, Play them at, like you said. I could play six of them in every night that I've never played before. Whether we're doing a Zach Sabbath show and I'm playing six Barbarians, Purple Barbarians, with a, you know, with a buzz saw on it. I the whole thing is, I've never played the guitar before, and I know it's going to be once you hand it to me, it's going to be slamming. 
So well, speaking of speaking of being on stage, uh, I have to ask you: you've toured the entire world pretty much with some of the most decorated musicians in history, including yourself. Um, yourself among them. I, if you, if you, <laughs> I, take it from me, man. Uh, <laughs> if you want to, what's an obscure story people may not have heard before? No, I don't. I don't know. I mean, put, put it this way: I've had. You know, I think if you ask any musician, I mean, I've had just as much fun, like with Zach Sabbath, us playing these keg parties when we were 16, 17 years old, playing War Pigs and NIB. And now I'm 54 years old and we're still playing War Pigs and NIB, (laughs) except there's more people at the keg parties. (laughs) But I mean, but I still have, I still get just as much of a rush every night before, before the kabuki drops, before we go on stage, whether, whether I, you know, the first show I ever did with Oz when we were in Pensacola, Florida. And, and then we, I remember we played hammer jacks in Baltimore on the, like, just like a club, these club shows just before the tour started, like these surprise gigs or whatever. Those are just as exciting as playing when we played in Russia in 89 at the Moscow Peace Festival in front of 100,000 every day. You know, I mean, I'm just saying, I think if you ask any musician, they'll tell you the same thing. Whether you're playing in a club in front of 20 people or you're playing in front of 100,000 people, the, the rush is, because if you love music, that's 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 what it's all about. Agreed. When, when you do interviews like these, what do people never ask you that you wish they would ask you? Um, uh, Zach, do you play anything other than pentatonic scales? <laughs> <laughs> no. Why? They're the most lyrical. So therefore, just stick with the pentatonic. Now, um, you well, I, I was I thought you were going to say, Zach, have you ever played any other instruments? And apparently, you played bass clarinet at one point. Is that true? Well, no, I play. Uh, no, but I, I think if you ask most guitar players, they'll tell you they play, you know, they could play bass. Uh, you know, I'm just saying if you had to do your record and you were going to play bass, you could you could pull it off. You know what I mean? But uh, depending on the music, you know what I mean? I'm just saying if we're doing, you know, s- standard rock stuff. But I mean, you know, a great bass player, that's a that's a whole that's a whole nother art. Yeah, form I agree. Playing. You know, great bass players are great. You know, J.D., it's just it's a it's a whole different mindset than just I'm saying than just copying a riff type thing like that. Mm-hmm. But uh, no, but I play bass. I'll play, you know, obviously piano, Hammond. Uh, but, you know, whenever we're arranging the strings on songs like Angel of Mercy or whatever, you know, I'll do the cello parts first and I'll do the violins, the violas, you know, like you you arrange them, you know what I mean? So, uh, no, I, you know, I, I think, what, but it's whatever you apply yourself to, you know what I mean? Yeah. If you're gonna, if you're gonna want to play, um, you know, I have a pedal steel up at the house. But I mean, that thing's a lot of fun to play, you know. So once we, I used it on, uh, what do we end up using it on? Darkest Days or whatever. I had it on like the intros of certain things because I, I mean, the pedal steel you can't emulate a pedal steel, you know, just by sitting playing slide guitar. Yeah. You know, more tears or whatever, but it's because it's because you have the string bender and you have it's just it's it's its own sound which is amazing. So, but, um, no, I, I think with that, with all of us, I think it's whatever you apply yourself to and whatever you put the time into, it, but you got to have passion for it though. You know, whatever you're going to, cause if you're going to sit and practice five, 10 hours a day, you have to have passion for whatever it is you're doing. Definitely. So finally, Zach, to loop in your guitar, super villain, alter ego, which is actually wonder woman's bad side. I have one yeah. final question for you. What time of the month it is for me? <laughs> or if I, you know, I don't get my first cup of coffee in the morning, you know? Yeah, man. I, I have one final question. What do you believe about guitar that most guitar players might think is crazy? So this could be like a hard truth that guitar players need to hear yeah. or something. Well, no, I mean, that, that it's going to get you laid. I mean, that was always, that's like the, uh, it's like, really? That works? I, no, I never, I never, re- I mean, it's so funny because, you know, like how every, I remember being asked that one day, you know, like, well, Zach, did you get into guitar because you wanted to get chicks, you know, mm-hmm. like that never entered 
the equation for me. Like I didn't realize that like I'm going to sit and practice pentatonic and diatonic scales for 10 hours a day and learn how to play the solo, the stairway to heaven. That's going to help me get laid. I, I, I never, I just, I go, there's got to be an easier way, man. <laughs> How about just saying, hi, would you like to go out to a movie or something? I, I don't know, you know, but it's just, uh, yeah, even when I played sports, when I played football or baseball, I, it's just because I love the game. I, not because <laughs> I want to I hook up with chicks, man. You know, that you're doing two-a-days and practicing and going to the batting cage. I, I'm like, oh, really? Is it going to help me find a girlfriend? <laughs> <laughs> you can't bring your guitar into the movie theater and play Stairway to Heaven for her. No, you just no, got to get in there with pissing, them. You're pissing people off, bro. <laughs> <laughs> they they want to watch the movie, bro. So, Zach, uh, as we wind down here, I'd like to thank you for taking your valuable time this morning to be on Guitar Villains. Great talking to you, man, without yeah, a doubt. It's been a great honor to, to chat with you, and I'll look forward to seeing what treacherous plots you devise next in your musical you endeavors. Up, keep promoting the guitar, brother. It's awesome. Great Shall be done. Show, man. Without a doubt. Thanks, brother. All right, man. Father Tyler, have a good one, buddy. Take care. Thanks for having me on, man.